and welcome to the 6-5 Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners here at Futurum Research, and on behalf of my team at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad to have you. In this spotlight session, Futurum's Daniel Newman sits down with Jacqueline Woods, the Chief Marketing Officer for Teradata. Their conversation centers on one of my favorite topics, diversity, equity, and inclusion. While these are often mentioned as a cohesive idea, they are three individual concepts, each important in its own way. Daniel and Jacqueline tackle each concept and look at how companies are authentically embracing DEI. Without further ado, let's go hear what they've got to say. Jacqueline Woods, welcome to this year's 2022 6-5 Summit. So happy to have you here. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I... I'm so happy that we were able to add this track talking about social impact, ESG, DEI, such an important topic. I think the pandemic really brought the industry, the technology industry, and, and mo much of the world together to finally put some of these, these topics back in the spotlight, which is great. Having said that, though, Jacqueline, I also think sometimes all these topics can get a bit conflated. First of all, obviously everything from ESG, social impact, and DEI, they're all very different things. But even in DE and I, we are really talking about three different things. So what I thought we could do to start off is maybe we break down the DE and I components. I'd like to hear a little bit from you about what you're thinking about in each part of the DE and I uh, you know, components and how you're thinking about them at Teradata and, and, and beyond, by the way. Let's start with sure. DE. Sure. So um, for me, the reason that I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think really are three distinct topics because they address three different types of maybe issues or concerns that people have both in the workplace and in the world. So if you think about diversity, it can mean many things. It could be diversity of thought, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of gender, that is very different than equity and how do we create an equitable environment or an equitable workplace. So if you think about equity unto itself, if you have equity across everyone that's in your work environment, then in some ways, the issue of diversity is probably less of an issue because the reason why we have some of the issues is because diverse groups oft, often are paid less, diverse groups are often more underrepresented in the workplace, diverse groups uh, tend to uh, maybe feel less included, uh, which is why people have diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so then if you take inclusion, it's, you know, do people feel that they can not just be their authentic selves, but do you actually include them as part of your overall processes to make your company better or your organization? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good breakdown there. And, you know, as I mentioned about the spotlight that had been placed on these things over the last couple of years, and obviously they've been worked on for a long time, but I think it's, it could be debated pretty significantly that progress has not been good enough and not been fast enough. And I think that was a lot of what started to come out in these years while we were all able to kind of sit and reflect and not be unmo as mobile. Um, and, and, you know, the technology industry um, is a great, you know, it's a sub <laughs> uh, representation of all markets, uh, maybe even a little bit more slanted to certain demographics because of, you know, high pay scale, certain uh, types of educations required to get into the industry. Um, so I'd love to get your take in the tech industry at large, you know, do you think we're making progress? Has representation been improving within groups that have been marginalized? What is sort of the trend you're seeing? I, I don't think we've made enough progress. Um, and I think that that's across the board. And, and so the way that I like to think about it is the following. Um, in most technology companies, and I've been in tech 
for 30 years, right? And if you look at all of them, they all have the same thing, which means that they have sales, marketing, development, you know, finance, operations, HR. It's a company. It's no different than any other space. Having said that, when you look across even all the functions in a technology company uh, that where marginalized groups can participate, you often don't even find those groups being uh, inclusive. So the overall organization itself tends not to really have, I think, great representation of underrepresented um, ethnic groups, quite frankly. And so if you think about it being somewhat the 80-20 rule, 80% everything else and maybe 20% development, right? Because you could argue, well, do, you know, are there enough science majors and engineers and all of this? And, and, and that also is debatable, by the way. They're, they, they are not in the tech industry, but they are there and they are out there. Um, I don't think we've done enough to find them, include them. And oftentimes when they come to technology companies, oftentimes they don't feel like their careers are moving and they may go do something else at another, at another organization that wants a similar type of skills. I just think that we haven't done enough to across the board look at what we are doing with marginalized groups and understanding that if you don't have a pipeline and you're not moving people up a pipeline, that it will be hard for a marginalized group to ever ascend in an organization and to have critical mass. And I think that there's enough evidence that demonstrates that. Yeah, it's interesting. In the opening keynote for the event, uh, we talked to Arvind Krishna, CEO of IBM, and, and one of the things that he mentioned was exactly what you did about that sort of education, the, the historic tech industry wanted those four-year degrees and in many roles, master's plus and PhDs. And, you know, he actually mentioned that, you know, with the talent shortage we're currently experiencing, we need to be thinking about how tech can leverage its own efficiencies and productivity uh, to actually create more jobs that don't require degrees in college education, to create analysts and, and pipeline roles within organizations that can be taught um, in the field that can be learned skills. And, and so it's sort of interesting because I, I kind of see there, you know, we need more ways to create that inclusion um, and to, to be able to find diversity that's not always focused on. Go ahead. Well, I think that's a, that, I think that's a great point, but I also think that in some ways has been an excuse because I think didn't Steve Jobs drop out of school, didn't Bill Gates drop out of school, didn't, um, you know, Zuckerberg doesn't have a four-year degree. And there are many, I think, I think that's right. I'm not hundred percent sure whether he has one. I don't think Larry has one either. Um, so you have all these people who actually don't and didn't have degrees, might have gone to, you know, some of these great institutions kind of hung out for a couple of years and then started to do something else. So clearly the, the recipe for success doesn't hinge on whether you have a four-year degree from an, from an Ivy League school. Um, and, and so again, that is a way for exclusion, right? So when you right. create certain types of boundaries for people that you're saying you have to get over this hurdle, when in fact, there are many people in this industry, quite frankly, who have made uh, quite a great um contribution to society and a great living. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to, would want to be them uh, and they don't have degrees. And so I think we need to re really figure out a way to identify and find talent and make sure that that talent is able to, you know, scale up. I mean, there, there are people who, even in my own company, who I know may not have a four-year degree, who are very senior in our organization. So, so the difference is you need to ensure that that uh, ability to scale up isn't just for the majority if you don't have a degree and not something that limits a minority 
if they don't have a degree. Absolutely. And I, I think um, just to make sure I, I, I clarify, you two are really in, in agreement that there are many opportunities for people without four-year degrees and companies need to find ways to facilitate, train, learn on demand in this current era. That was really kind of what he was saying. And I've taken what you were saying, you know, we need to open more doors that there are people that can be trained to do important roles in companies that won't need to go get a degree. And in fact, to your point, there are many that never get a degree that become extraordinarily successful um, and become the boss, the boss of many, <laughs> by the way, that do have degrees. Um, I want to pivot to the to equity. You started off kind of talking about the difference, right? That they're not the same thing. Again, DEI is getting bunched and grouped at times. But, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how it's different, but how do, how do you solve for environments to, you know, for organizations to take on the equity side of it? I mean, even in cases where they maybe are solving diversity and even being inclusive, that doesn't always mean they're being equitable, does it? No, it doesn't mean that they're being equitable, but I think you have to be willing to um, do the analysis and be transparent with yourself and your organization. Uh, I think Mark Benihoff has done a, a pretty good job with that, quite frankly. I mean, he's put it on the table as, as a thing um, that he would like to solve. He is somewhat taken up the mantle of I want equitable pay in my organization for men and women. And I want to make sure that that is something that I am looking at and that I am going to be intentional about. That hasn't, everyone hasn't said that, right? That's a very bold statement. There are so many statistics, particularly as it relates to women, you know, you know, what a, you know, a X, you know, a white female makes this percent compared to a white male. They have it for Asian females. They have it for black females. They have it for his, you know, Hispanics. And it, the bottom line is it's less, 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 less. So it doesn't really matter what the role is. If you're consistently making less money. And as we, you and I talked about, even before we started the show, we talked about our kids going to college. And if you assume that because I'm a black female that I make less money, that over time, my ability to send my child to school would be a much more difficult proposition for me than it would be for you. And so it has some really long-term repercussions that I think are really the the, the issue, not just, hey, someone makes less money, it's less ability to do the things that you need to do to level up your family. Yeah, I think, um, by the way, that, that brings together some good points. You know, it, you as leading Teradata, though, a company that's in technology, that thinks about data <laughs> at scale, talk a little bit about, how, you know, Where's the role that tech data play? I mean, what's Teradata's approach to, to making this happen? I think the role of analytics and uh, insights is really the, the first and foremost, right? Because analytics is the thing that helps you understand whether you actually have a problem or not. It is a thing that provides you insights into whether there is bias or not. And it is, the, it, is, it is those insights that help you understand what are the things that you can particularly do to make those changes in your organization. You know, I recently even looked at my organization just in terms of pay equity and said, I need to make sure compared to the marketplace, where is my organization? How do I make sure that the people, and, and I obviously was only able to do that with data and analytics, but I was purposeful about asking the question. I was purposeful about like looking across the entire organization. And I think as a leader, you then have to go lay, layer deeper and say, okay, even if you're, um, at a certain point and you think that you're being equitable, 
is that equity across all groups? Is it equity across gender? Is it equity across marginalized groups? Do you have some bias that was already built in, particularly when you come into an organization, right? None of us creates what's there before us, but we have a responsibility for equalizing it once we're there. Absolutely. You know, we've covered D and E, Jacqueline. I want to talk a little bit about I. You sort of referenced it a little bit uh, when we talked about the complexities of bringing these three elements together. There certainly is an interdependence, but, right. you know, you're a C-suite exec. Um, how are you ensuring that, you know, these groups are included in ways, and by the way, not just for the sake of inclusion, right? Because in a business, you right. have a, a fiduciary, you have a responsibility to your shareholders. Um, you know, to drive success. You have to balance, you know, you have to put inclusion ahead to drive results. How do you do that? Well, first and foremost, I think that, I, I think you have to build inclusive organizations, right? And that tone of inclusivity gets set at the top. So whatever function you're leading, the role of inclusivity starts with the leader of the function and making sure that you're creating an environment yourself with your leadership team that is an inclusive environment, right? And then making sure that you are kind of cascading that throughout the organization. I, I probably, people who've worked with me may say, I don't know, maybe I over-include. Because, and the reason I say that, I, I, opting out is always the thing that people can do. When people are invited to something and they kind of figure out, well, I don't know if I really need to be in this meeting going forward, or I don't know if this is the, you know, this work doesn't necessarily apply to me, they can always opt out. But what often happens in organizations, as you know, is like there'll be a meeting and then someone says, like they hear about it and they're like, oh, I didn't get invited or I wasn't included, all right? And then that kind of starts, you know, kind of a little pattern there. And I think that you, if you, the person with the power, period, has responsibility to be the includer. The person with the power has the responsibility to be the includer. You can't expect people just to kind of keep knocking on the door, asking to come in, because they may do that once or twice, but they're not going to continue to do it. And they're likely, if they feel not included, will a trick from your company or your organization, for sure. I mean, you, you see it and you hear it in, you know, surveys and things like that. Absolutely. This, I mean, the surveys definitely show that um, companies that are putting forward investment focus on DE&I are getting better results. I think you've already outlined a few of the ways that that's happened. And you know, we only have a few minutes here and, you know, you as someone who is really leading this for a large publicly traded organization in the spotlight, putting out promises, being held accountable to those promises, I'd love to kind of get your advice here. I'd like for you to kind of share, you know, I think that, you know, I mentioned that this got suddenly brought to the attention probably should have been much sooner, but it's in focus now. But for executives that this wasn't a focus for, for companies that maybe this had been sort of sidelined or had been more just something that was kind of, you know, in the purview, how do you really help them? What kind of guidance can you give them to say, how do you, you know, let's get started. Let's accelerate this effort. And let's make this happen in a way that everybody from the outside and inside can feel that real progress is being made. I'll say a couple things. First of all, when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, it wasn't because they wanted to break the color barrier. It was because they wanted to win. And uh, the reason that often, uh, you know, people go out and kind of survey the landscape. If, if I want to win, I need to bring the best talent on my team. The best talent is across the board, comes from all places it comes from all genders and if you really want to win you need to really 
and you really want to do that, then diversity of needs to be part of that because diversity of thought is what helps you win. And you get diversity of thought from people with different backgrounds. So the way to get started is ask yourself the question, when you look at yourself and your peer set, are you above them or below them? And if they, if the people above you actually have a more intentional process around diversity, you can assume that they have, you know, more innovation, they have a more inclusivity, and that they have a culture that will drive them forward in a positive way. And if that's something that you want, to me, that's the number one reason why this is something you should lean into. And you need to get started by examining and understanding where your organization is today. And then really kind of, if you need external help to do that, um, do it, but bring in an HR leader who can help you transform your company. Uh, that really is where you need to start. It starts with culture and culture drives behavior. And I think culture, as they say, each strategy every day of the week. So when you have a great culture, you can create that winning environment. And I do think that those cultures that have more diverse diversity, equity, and inclusion are cultures that win. I love that. The great uh, Peter Drucker, I think it exactly. was his quote that said, uh, what is it, culture eats strategy for breakfast? Exactly. And so it sounds like everybody that's getting started needs a big dose of culture. And by the way, um, years of research on our end about digital transformation has identified that culture more than any technology, more than budget, uh, more than anything else is the deciding factor. Um, and it sounds like adding in DEI and building these as muscles and muscle memory in the culture of your organization um, is going to continue to prove out. And hopefully companies like Teradata can build out the analytics to keep on showing that along with analysts and research firms like my own. We that definitely way. have analytics that can help you. So plug for you and plug for me. Love it. Love it. Jacqueline Woods, CMO, Teradata. Thanks so much for joining me this year at the 6.5 Summit. Thank you. Have a great day.